So as well, probably familiar by now, the first step of meditation is to turn off your cell phone. And if you could please leave it off until nine o'clock. Oh, I can't turn mine totally off. It's the meditation bell. Okay. So we'll find our meditation posture. As many of you have heard me say, there's two things that particularly matter about the posture. One is that you're comfortable enough that you won't need to move. And we will try not to move. If you do move, uh, we all pre-forgive you. <laughs> it's not a, a commandment not to move. It's, it's a mindfulness practice. The goal is when you need to move, notice that you need to move and try not to. <clears throat> so to aid that, we'll get as comfortable as possible. You can grab uh, the Zafus are in the corner there if, uh, if anybody would prefer to sit on the floor. The other thing that matters about the posture is that you're not going to fall asleep. It's late-ish evening on a work night, so that's an easy thing to do. So a decent rule of thumb is the more tired you are, the less comfortable you should actually have your posture. <clears throat> so... Um, Keeping your back off the chair, there's a risk of falling asleep. Most people that I know meditate with their eyes closed. There's just fewer distractions if you can't see anything. But if you prefer eyes open, that's fine as well. <clears throat> and we'll, we'll start the way we always do by bringing the attention to the feelings of your breath. Most people feel this easiest in their nose. <clears throat> but if you feel it easier somewhere else, like in your belly, or your throat, or your chest, there's nothing special about the nose. We're just looking for some place to hold the attention. <clears throat> and as we put the breath in the front, the goal is to leave everything else in the background. So uh, it's usually pretty loud outside here while we're meditating. It was especially loud last week. So we'll try to leave all of the outside sounds of cars and music and upstairs neighbors in the background. Try to leave feelings in our body in the background. Memories and images and emotions. And for most of us, the hardest thing to leave in the background is going to be that voice in your head that never stops talking. It tends to be discursive. It just rambles and rambles. It doesn't seem to like you very much. It jumps around from, do you have too much for dinner before you got here? Who do you really wish you could make out with? What was a stupid thing you said when you were 17? And on and on and on. While some minority of people get most distracted by images, for what I think is the majority, we'll get distracted by talking to ourselves in our heads. If you try to stop the voice in your head, you will get very, very lost. You'll also find the voice turns right back on. So don't ever try to shut off the talking in your head. Our goal, which we were working with last week as well, is to treat it no different than the talking we'll hear outside. It's just noise. We don't have to go outside and ask them to be quiet so we can meditate. And similarly, we don't have to go inside and ask ourselves to be quiet so we can meditate. I usually start by asking everyone to focus on the breath. I think it's uh, the easiest meditation to tell whether you're doing what you're meant to be doing or not. So it's a good way to get your attention focused, good way to get out of your head and planning and worrying and that sort of thing. 
It's maximally portable. The breath is always with you. I think it feels pretty nice. There's generally this delicious cold feeling on the in-breath, although not quite as cold this evening. And this relaxation that comes from the out-breath, letting the body contract and let go as we breathe out. And as I've been going through this series of meditations, starting with the breath has often been a way to dive in. Uh, for this evening, if you're new at meditation, or your mind's pretty scattered, you, you feel new at meditation tonight, I would just stick with breath like usual. If these instructions make sense, what I'd suggest doing is foreground and background. And it's the instructions from the Mind Illuminated a book some of you may be familiar with. It's exactly the same as, as vision. You can look at something in the center of your vision. And you can look at me and, and you can see the room behind me very easily. So if these instructions make sense, what we'll do for the next few minutes is keep the breath in the front of your attention and let everything in the background just be there. So, for instance, there's cars and voices from the street. And it's actually pretty easy for me to feel my breath and know that there are voices from the street. I'm really not paying any attention. I don't actually know what the voices are saying because I'm not really paying attention. But I, I know that they're there. I'm sure, like many of you, my shirt is uh, stickier than I wish it were, and, and I can feel that sensation in my body. I know it's there, and I'm not looking at it. Just like on a Zoom call. You can see the whole world behind your computer, even though you're focusing on the call. While if you get really good at breath meditation, eventually you want to release your effort. When you're getting started, effort's pretty useful at bringing the breath into the center. Effort is totally useless, totally counterproductive at keeping things in the background. If you're staring at your Zoom call and forgot there was a world behind your computer, all you do is decide to see it, that's it. It's almost like request peripheral vision and it turns right on. So if the breath isn't in the center, there is some effort. We pick up the attention and move it back to the breath, or pick up the breath and move it into the center, whatever imagery you like. And if you notice that all you have is the breath, that's just a decision. Just decide to hear the footsteps upstairs. And there they are.
trying to keep the background and trying to sit still. These two practices actually support each other. If you have some background, you might notice that desire to move. And if you're trying to stay still, it uh, will help you notice those desires as well. So if you have an itch, try not to scratch it. And if your knee's sore, just let it be sore. That compressor noise is pretty helpful. I can be totally focused on my breath, not lose any of it, and know when the compressor's on, and I'll know when it turns off. Well, some effort can be helpful for putting the breath in the center. Most people are using more than they need to. So you can play around with effort for a minute. If you relax it all the way, you'll probably space out. But you can try relaxing it a bit. If that goes well, try relaxing it a bit more. The rule with effort and meditation is always to use the least that you can. And that amount, the least that you can, is going to vary quite a lot based on how your mind's doing in this moment.
Oh. Uh, progressive steps of the practice get harder. I'm not going to give any instructions that are terribly challenging tonight. But please feel free to stay with earlier ones if they're working better for you. So what I'd like to suggest next is doing exactly what you're doing, keeping the breath in the front of your attention and whatever else is going on in the background. But essentially flip which one you care about. The way this would look visually is I could tell you to stare at me and then notice the wall behind me. I could then tell you to really care about the wall behind me. Don't take your eyes off me. I'm in the center. But I don't really matter. Let me go fuzzy. What we care about is the background. If this doesn't make a whole lot of sense, stick with the previous instruction. It's a very slight shift. Uh, any effort here, again, won't make sense. It's just a decision, just a way of looking. If you get confused, the visual analogy will work perfect. If you're real confused, you can open your eyes and try it. Stare at something and then care about the periphery.
And of course you'll get distracted from time to time. Nothing to do about that. Just come back. And for the last part of the meditation, I'm going to do a technique called guarding the sense doors. It's a pretty simple technique. I think actually just the instruction, do mindfulness, might be a way of describing the technique. So we'll drop the breath. If it's there in your awareness or not, it doesn't really matter. The goal is simply to be mindful of what's occurring in your experience. If you're familiar with practices like shikantaza or do nothing, you'll notice some similarities, but there's a one significant difference, which is in those practices, you're just relaxing, you're just letting go. In this, we're actively trying to keep mindfulness up. Mindfulness here means you know what's happening. Sometimes when people say to the Buddha, what's so special about you? He doesn't say he can fly or walk on water or read minds, although he does claim all those things. What he says is so special is he says, when I'm taking a short breath, I know I'm taking a short breath. And, and when I take a long breath, I know it's long. And, I'm happy, I know I'm happy, and, and so on. So this is how you think of mindfulness. It's this knowledge of what's going on. And it's sometimes talked about as kind of an objective knowledge. Objective is in, you don't feel all that blended with it. Well, when you hear the door close just now, you know that's the door closing. It doesn't feel like it's your door closing.
So it's okay if you need to, to do some labeling in your head, but if, if you can get it without the labels, that's what I would try. So one way to get distracted here is to get kind of dopey. Some of the Buddhist texts call it subtle dullness. I think your mind just kind of feels like soup. Another way to get lost here is to get involved with the contents of mind. Really listening up close to your thoughts as though they're saying something important arguing back with your thoughts. I'm saying that one thing I like about the breath practice is it's uh, easy to know whether you're doing what you meant to be. In this practice, it's quite a bit harder. That question of were you distracted or were you focused isn't quite so easy. So if you're finding that that's making it hard to practice, I'd go back to one of the earlier instructions. And certainly a uh, more challenging practice to try to just observe what's happening. And one thing that can actually feel really nice is observing it without trying to change it. Of course, it's kind of a, a buzz phrase you hear in meditation circles all the time. I actually find it's really nice to feel it without trying to change it. There's some tension in the top of my back. And if it stays there, I'll have to think about stretches and PT and Advil and so on. It's actually really relaxing to just not care about it. I'm not going to do anything about it.
Now, if you find you're getting lost in thought, there's this trick where you orient towards the thought more like sound. As I keep referencing it, it's just like the passing conversations. You don't really listen to what they're saying. You just know there's sound out there. Try treating your thoughts more like sound. It's easier to be mindful, aware that there is thinking.
Nice work, everybody. You did it.